Have you ever had a nickname? Nicknames are kind of fun because lots of times they tell you something about a person, maybe a characteristic or the way that they used to be when they were little or something. When I was growing up uh, at church, I had a friend and his nickname was Gordo, which is Spanish for fat. His real name Ra was Raul and dripping wet, he might have weighed 95 pounds, but Gordo stuck because he wasn't. A couple of years ago, I found out that a very dignified member of our congregation had a nickname. His mom called him Chip. And I said, is it all right if I call you Chip? And he said, absolutely not. Nicknames are kind of fun. And so I decided I've never really had a nickname. Maybe I should look up a cool nickname for myself. So I literally did what everyone does when you need information. I just Googled cool nicknames. And Google actually had this suggestion. What are some catchy nicknames? And these were some of their ideas. Shorty, Nugget, Teacup, Oldie, Kiddo, Smarty, Boomer, and Scout. I was like, these catchy nicknames for the 1890s? <laughs> it's not exactly a nickname, but Jesus is known by another, a number of other names. And one of them is Prince of Peace. And that's an important theme all year round, but peace comes up a lot during Advent. Uh, because we have a chance to focus on what Jesus brings to the world. And so it's not like we're breaking brand new ground by talking about peace or even the Prince of Peace this Advent. But I think it's a little bit more special because of the context that we put it in. When we entered into this whole pandemic era, the first pandemic Christmas 2020, we thought, what do people need most? And we landed on people needed hope. And then 2021, things were changing, opening up a little bit. Life wasn't anywhere near normal. There's still a lot of uncertainty. And we thought, joy, that's what people need. And this year, it seems like the thing that we all need is peace. And so that's why we're talking about peace and how Jesus is the Prince of Peace this Advent. And so I'm going to read a really familiar passage from Isaiah chapter 9 for you. For to us a child is born... To us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness. From that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So it's a pretty familiar passage, and if you're like me, Handel's Messiah plays in your brain when you hear that. But let's put this familiar passage into a little bit of context, because in Isaiah 7, or just a couple of chapters before what we had just read, we learned that Isaiah the prophet was sent to Jerusalem in 741 BC to speak to King Ahaz. And he was sent with really a redemptive message because the city of Jerusalem was surrounded by armies from Syria and Israel, their northern cousins. And they were there because the big power in the region, Assyria, was on the move. And so they were trying to have these different alliances and they didn't want to play in Judah. And so these other forces came against them. So this is pretty dire. You have two foreign armies around your city and you have the global power close behind them. And so there's war, there's the threat of war, and this is very real. And in the midst of these tough times, because of human nature, Isaiah records that there was a lot of people who were just running around going, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, we'll all be killed. But in the midst of these depressing passages and the doomsayers, God steps in and he brings this word to remind his people that God's plan is to intervene. And he wants his people to see that even in these dire situations, war, rumors of wars, that they have hope. And in the last sermon series, we saw this over and over and over, that God's message to his people was always one of hope, that he was in control. And it's kind of interesting in this passage how this all plays out. Because at the beginning of chapter 9, 
you have some obscure references to Zebulon and Naphtali, which are two of the 12 tribes of Israel. And they're the, the two tribes that are the absolute furthest north in the country. And the reason why this is important is because if Assyria sweeps in, these are gonna be the first two tribes that go. It would be like if, you know, Port Orchard decided to attack us, that hit Olala first. So that's like Zebulon and Naphtali. And it talks about how they've been humbled. Then it mentions all of Galilee, which is the area that they're in. And that's where the threat is greatest. But where the threat is greatest, where the darkness is darkest, this prophecy says, this is where the light is going to come first. Now, this is a good word for the people who are living in Isaiah's time and you know, the eighth century BC, but we also can look at it through a different frame because 800 years later, something really important happens. In Isaiah, the message is that hope and peace will come first to the region of the Galilee. And if you fast forward 800 years, who comes from Galilee? The ultimate fulfillment of the prophecy is that Jesus comes from Galilee. The darkest place is where the light will be seen first. The place that most is war-torn, that most needs to be redeemed, is where redemption will come first. So this is written to a people who felt surrounded, who could only imagine that the future had war and destruction and pain ahead of them. And the, the verse says, the prophecy says, here's a picture of your God. In the midst of war and the threat of war, he is the Prince of Peace. So what is peace? What does peace look like? Well, I think for us today, when we think of peace, we, we want war to cease. We, we want the Russian invasion of Ukraine to stop. We look around the world and there's wars in Myanmar and Ethiopia and Syria and Yemen and other places and we want those wars to stop. There are areas of potential conflict between India and Pakistan, between the United States and China, between lots of other nations, and we want those potential conflicts to stop before they start. There's wars between cartels and militias that are devastating families and communities, and we want all that to stop. We want people to be able to live their lives and go to school or go to work or go shopping or go to a nightclub and not have to worry about getting shot. We want domestic abuse to stop. We don't want any kid to go to sleep afraid of what might be done to them in the dark. We want silly squabbles that have been blown out of proportion to stop. We want the noise to stop, the constant ads, the bots, the news, the updates, the demands, the pressures. We want our heart rates to slow and our adrenaline levels to drop. We want our anxiety to melt away. We want to be released from our depression we want to take a deep breath and feel whole and safe and at peace. It's like we have this visceral reaction to all of the things that are going on around us that just feel chaotic and disturbing and wrong. And we want those things to be replaced by a sense of peace. And this passage reminds us that that's what God wants too. And the passage reminds us that this is what God wants promises. So whatever it is that's sucking the peace out of you this Advent, in the darkest places of your mind in your life, this passage reminds us that Jesus is present there and he wants to bring you, he wants to bring us his peace. And then the passage goes on to reveal more of his plan. In verse 7 it says, of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on forever. Two really important phrases, among many important phrases, there will be no end from that time on and forever. The character of the peace that Jesus brings will last forever. Um, I've been reading just because of the time of the year this pops up in, in some of the, my reading list about the Christmas truce of 1914. It was during World War I and Germany and Britain and allies were on opposite sides of just the horrific trench warfare. And for a couple of hours around Christmas Day in 1914, there was an informal truce. 
and there are stories about how soldiers came out and met with each other and talked to each other, even exchanging some gifts. And there's one picture that you can see now that shows soldiers from opposite sides actually playing soccer together. And it was amazing because for a moment the war was forgotten and everybody was just people. But the peace only lasted until Christmas ended and they were back fighting again. That's not the type of peace that God is promising us in Jesus. That's not the character of the peace that Jesus brings. It won't end. Jesus is bringing us a peace that will last forever. And that's the future that we're moving towards. There's this future that God has that's bright and good and promised that he's already in and calling us to because he knows what it's going to be like. But it's not just future. It's something that we can learn to live in now. And ultimately, the kingdom and the government will belong to God and it will last forever and ever. And the character of the government will be peace and justice and righteousness. It's not accidental. It's not wishful thinking. It's guaranteed, not only by the promise of God, but by the resurrection. God is pulling us into a place where there's hope on the horizon. And this hope is where we're ultimately headed. It says, he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. That time. It sort of looks into the future, but it also has the sense that it has already begun. And certainly in the fact that Jesus has come and lived among us. It's, we're in this period that an old theology professor named George Eldon Ladd used to call the already, but not yet. And what he meant by that is the peace of God, the hope of God, the kingdom of God has come among us, but it's not completely fulfilled. We're living in this in-between time where it started, but not finished. Jesus' peace is among us, but it doesn't reign everywhere. Everything is still broken, but little by little, person by person, area by area, the peace of Christ grows and the kingdom of God grows. We're in the already, but not yet. And you can see that by reading the news. But we can begin to live into it. We don't have to wait for that future day when it all comes together. We can live in it now. We can have Jesus' peace with us now, even in the midst of sometimes very stressful situations. So how do we tap into it? Well, the first thing we need to do is we need to get peace in our hearts. If you look back over the last three years, the, the COVID period, look at the amount of time that you've spent doing anything over the past three years because it's been an incredibly stressful time. How much time did you spend walking, running, exercising, cycling, whatever you do that's physical? How much time did you spend watching the news? How much time did you spend scrolling through social media? How much time did you spend listening to music? Because all of those things shape who we are. So I have this new playlist that I've been listening to. Um, my dad used to listen to a couple of artists and one of the singers that he really liked was this guy named Marty Robbins. And it just is the soundtrack of my childhood growing up with my dad. And so I found this Marty Robbins album um, and it was Gunslinger Ballads. And so they're all about the Wild West and somebody who has a big iron on his hip and shoots you know, this, that, or the other person. Ever since I started listening to this playlist, I can't tell you how many dreams I have had at night about me having guns and shooting people. Because for good or bad, Marty Robbins and his singing has gotten into my heart. It's just what I'm thinking about. And that's just kind of a simple example, but the things that we listen to, the things that we do, the things that we spend time on, that begins to shape who we are. And when we spend our time and our efforts chasing after things that will bring us peace, if we're in God's word, if we're in prayer, if we're doing important stuff, then that will be reflected in the peace that we have in our hearts. If we're spending a lot of time on social media, if we're spending a lot of time on the news, doing other kinds of things, it's no wonder we're chaotic on the inside. I remember, and I've told you this story several times, that when the pandemic first hit, when it was, you know, the Black Death, that's all we knew about it, was just terrible. 
I sat down every single morning and I read from the Minor Prophets, which are incredibly depressing. But the reason that I wanted to read from the Minor Prophets was because it's the story of God's interaction with people who are going through really, really difficult times and a reminder of God's hope and presence with us. And so as I sat in the Minor Prophets during those dark days, I got connected to God in a new and different way because I had a different way to interpret the darkness and the, the hurt and the uncertainty and the chaos that was around me because as depressing as the Minor Prophets can be, there's always this word of hope. And as hard as it was to look at about COVID and think about COVID and then all of the other things that were going on in our country, I had this daily connection with a reminder that God was holding all things together. And that helped me have a deep sense of peace. So read Jesus Calling. Read a psalm a day. Read a proverb a day. Do whatever it takes to get God's word inside of you. Uh, take a deep breath with the Jesus prayer like we talked about a couple of weeks ago and experience God filling you instead of the chaos of the world because God wants you to have his peace. I think too we need to examine what we're invested in and this is a perfect thing for us to do during Advent because Advent is a season of preparation. The two biggest holidays in Christianity, Christmas and Easter, all have a season of preparation ahead of them. Christmas has Advent, Easter has Lent. It's to give us four weeks or six weeks to think about, to ponder about the things we're about to celebrate. What does it mean that Jesus has come into our world? What does it mean that Jesus is Prince of Peace in 2022 and 2023 to us? So we've got time to examine our lives, examine our hearts, to look at what's most important to us and to get our hearts ready. So what are you invested in? Where are you spending your money? Where are you spending your time? Because what I've learned is what we say is important to us means relatively little. It's what we actually do. And then if, you, if you're living in the Jesus way, you'll find peace in your life. But if you're letting anger or your personal deficits or your desire for money or attention or whatever control the decisions that you make, you're only gonna find strife. And so I'm really hoping this Advent season that the dreams of Wild West gunslingers will be replaced by visions of angels singing about peace. That's what I want to connect with deeply. I'm hoping that I'll take the time to hear from the prophets and not the pundits, and that I'll be reminded that peace comes from following the way of Jesus, not a platform or a policy or a philosophy. I think also, and I think we need to take this seriously, I don't think we give this enough time, the Holy Spirit empowers us to create a community of peace. If you grew up in a liturgical church, there's a spot in uh, the liturgy, in the order of worship, that's called the passing of the peace. If you grew up in uh, any other church, it was probably just called greeting time. But in a liturgical church, it's called the passing of the peace, and you turn to people around you, and you literally say something like, the peace of Christ be with you, and they respond, and also with you. And it, it might just seem rote, might just seem like a funky thing to say, but it's actually quite profound. Because there are very few places on earth where somebody wishes you the peace that, God's, that God brings. And not only wishes that to you, but it's also kind of this promise that they're creating with you this place that reflects the peace of God. Most places you get, you know, hi, how are you, which is great. But being wished and prayed the peace of Christ, I think that's pretty profound. And we have the opportunity to be people of peace. Over the last four to six years, depending on how you want to count it or measure of it, there's been so much chaos that has roiled our country and has roiled our churches, that has disturbed our peace. I read this little quote from Russell Moore the other day that, that I needed to wrestle with a little bit. As he was talking about some of the chaos, he says, some of the multi-ethnic churches I saw most divided over these matters aren't multi-ethnic anymore. Some of the multi-generational churches I saw wrenched over these issues aren't multi-generational anymore. 
And what he's getting at is he's saying that the churches, congregations that were made up of different types of people, people who looked different, people who were from different age groups, and you, you can broaden that out to socioeconomic groups, political parties, whatever. So many of those churches weren't able to hold it together. Instead, they splintered so that they could just be with people who were like-minded, exactly like them. They gave up their peace. Their peace was sabotaged. Sometimes it was stolen from them, but more often than not, they just decided to give it up in place of having other things. We gave up the peace of Christ, but we can be communities of peace. In Luke chapter 6, verse 32, Jesus says, If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. If the only people that you can have fellowship with in the community of the church, if the only people that you can extend peace to are people who are just like you, that doesn't say much for the transforming power of God. One of the very last words that Jesus says to his disciples before he goes out to the Garden of Gethsemane is recorded in John 14, verse 27, where Jesus says, Peace I, live with, I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. So as we walk through this Advent season, maybe another thing that we could ask ourselves is, what do we leave in our wake? Do we sow peace, or do we sow strife? And then this verse ends with this tagline, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. I think that's a throwaway line. I think that's a reminder that peace is something that God cares about deeply. And bringing peace to all people for all times is not just wishful thinking. We have this promise from God. And God is the ultimate promise keeper that the Prince of Peace is coming. He first came to the people under the shadow of war in the book of Isaiah. It was fulfilled at that first Christmas and is still in the process of being ultimately fulfilled. One of the cool things about Advent is it's designed for us to look in two different directions. We look backward at the first Christmas. We look backward at when Jesus came and lived among us and began this kingdom of peace. But Advent also looks forward to the second coming of Christ, when Jesus will come and complete the work that he began and peace will reign forever and ever. So let me ask you three questions. What is one way you can spend time connecting with God during this Advent season? Number two, what gets in the way of you experiencing Jesus' peace? And number three, how does it change things for you knowing that God promises peace here and now? Thank you.